going to get started now. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Sarah Linkert, and I am the Assistant Director of the Center for Russia, East Europe, and Central Asia at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, one of the organizers of today's event. I am thrilled to welcome you to a book launch celebrating the publication of Maria Stepanova's The Voice Over, Poems and Essays, published by Columbia University Press, 2021. Our partner in this book launch is A Room of One's Own, an independent feminist bookstore that has been a fixture of downtown Madison, Wisconsin since 1975. You can pre-order Maria Stepanova's The Voice Over, which is now in stock, as well as her two other recent books, In Memory of Memory and War of the Beast and the Animals from A Room of One's Own. Today's book launch will consist of two reading portions. We kindly ask that you save your questions until after the second reading portion and then enter your questions into the chat. If you would like to follow along in Russian with the poems you read, please click the link in the chat to access a PDF of the Russian text. And now, please allow me to introduce the moderator of today's event, Kevin Platt. Platt is a scholar of Russian literature and culture and professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He is the founder of Your Language, My Ear Translation Symposium that is convened periodically at UPenn since 2011. He has translated a number of contemporary Russian poets with translations that have appeared in World Literature Today, N Plus One, Poetry International, and other journals. He is editor and lead translator for Hit Parade, the Orbita Group, published in 2015, that includes works of remarkable contemporary Russian poets from Latvia. He is co-editor with Polina Barskova of the volume in preparation of Dmitry Kuzmin's Poetry in English Translation. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. Um, and it's such an honor to be here. And thank you, Irina and Sarah, for inviting me to, to take part in this really wonderful event. I've been given the formidable task of introducing the central protagonists of the action here today. Um, and first, I'll say it's just an honor to have been invited to engage in some discussion with Maria Stepanova, uh, who is one of the most versatile, original, and brilliant poets working in Russian today, uh, as well as one of the most important critical voices uh, commenting on Russian letters with her essays. Uh, this event is her event, and the audience probably already knows quite a bit about her. Uh, so I'm going to limit my comments to saying that she is the author of many prize-winning books of poetry and essays. Her works have been translated into many languages, and she is additionally the editor and a founder of Porta.ru, which is perhaps the most important platform for literary writing and criticism in Russia uh, today. And I also want just to take a moment to congratulate Maria, as well as her translator, Sasha Dugdale, that the translation of Maria's experimental novel in Memory of Memory, uh, also recently published, has just been shortlisted for the International Booker. Uh, congratulations on that. That's just fantastic to both of you. Um, I will also introduce um, Irina Shevelenka, uh, who's the editor of the book we're celebrating today, this one, uh, The Voiceover. Uh, Irina is a towering figure in the study of Russian literature. Uh, she's an internationally recognized and renowned expert on the poetry and biography of Marina Tsvetaeva, as well as on the history and analysis of Russian modernism, modernist literature and culture more generally. Uh, she's the author of many highly regarded scholarly books and innumerable scholarly articles. You for your work on this amazing volume. Uh, it's impossible to put down once you pick it up. And I hope everyone in the audience is planning to pick it up soon. Um, so I'm gonna turn the, the floor over now to Irina and she will introduce the rest of our gathering and get us launched into the reading. Um, thank you very much, Kevin. And thank you very much for all, to all of you who found time in this uh, uh, Saturday, uh, well, for some morning, afternoon, evening, uh, to uh, have this event, uh, which uh, I think, uh, if not for the pandemic, uh, we wouldn't be able to have uh, in this format. Um, I will introduce now all the translators, and in fact, uh, this book is 
made by translators. So uh, this is the translators whom we celebrate today as much as uh, Marsha's work and my work as editor. So uh, I will go alphabetically and I've selected only a few most important credentials for our translators. I understand that otherwise our introductions uh, section may last uh, too long. Uh, I'll introduce Alexander Berliner, and maybe you just wave your hand to the audience uh, when I introduce him. So Alexander Ber Berliner translates between Russian and German and Russian and English both ways. Her poetry translations from Russian into English earned several prizes, such as the Joseph Brodsky Stephen Spender uh, Translation Prize in 2012. Uh, she also won the Skaglin Prize for a translation of a scholarly study in 2017 as editor and translator of the anthology Viktor Shklovsky, a reader, published in 2016. I also would like to parenthetic parenthetically note that last year, um, Alexandra translated into German or produced a new translation into German of uh, Bulgakov's uh, Master and uh, Margarita. Uh, uh, our second translator alphabetically is Sasha Dagdale, is a poet and playwright and translator. Uh, she is author of five collections of poems, the most recent of which, Deformations, was shortlisted for the uh, T.S. Eliot Prize in 2020. Uh, this year, uh, she published uh, two books of translations of Maria Stepanova's work. One is In Memory of Memory, already mentioned. Uh, the other uh, is the first uh, book of selected poems by Tsvetaeva she put together, entitled War of the Beasts and the Animals. I'm grateful to uh, Sasha and her publisher, uh, Bloodex, uh, for the possibility to include eight translations from the, uh, from the latter book into our volume. Uh, next translator is Sibylan Forrester. Uh, hello, Sibylan is professor of Russian at Swarthmore College and School of Russian Modernist Poetry. She writes her own poetry and has published poetic and scholarly translations uh, from Croatian, Serbian, and Russian. Her translations of Maria Stepanova's work appeared earlier in a number of publications, with the largest selection included in the bilingual volume three contemporary Russian women poets published in 2013. Our volume includes both essays and poems by Maria Stepanova in her translation. Uh, next translator, Emilia Glazer, hi Emilia, uh, is professor of Russian and comparative literature at the University of California, San Diego. She is a prolific scholar of Slavic Jewish cultural interactions in the borderlands of the Russian empire. Uh, and also of Yiddish culture in the U.S. Uh, more recently. And uh, she translates poetry from both Russian and Yiddish into English. Uh, now, the next translator is Zachary Murphy King. Zachary, could you wave your hand? Thank you. Uh, he is translator, writer, and uh, currently PhD student at the University of Chicago, where he is finishing a dissertation that is related to the topic of translation, uh, translation in the Soviet Union in 1930s. Um, now, Dmitry Manin, please wave your hand. Um, he is physicist, the only physicist among us. He is a physicist, uh, programmer, and poetry translator. He translates from English and French into Russian, and uh, among such translations from English, recent translations from English, um, uh, Ted Hughes's uh, Crown that came out in 2020, as well as a book of selected uh, poems by Allen Ginsberg that came out just this year. Uh, his uh, Russian to English translations appeared in several magazines and one of his Stepanova translations here is today earned him a Compass Award in 2017. Uh, next translator is Ansley Morse. Um, uh, hello, Ansley is a scholar and professor of Russian at Dartmouth College. Uh, she translates Russian, uh, Russian and former Yugoslav uh, literatures. Uh, from Russian, she translated, edited, and co edited books by Andrei Nikolev, Igor Holin, Sevot Nikrasov, Lydia Yusupova, Lenore Garalik, as well as uh, the anthology F Letter, New Russian Feminist Poetry, that came out in 2020. 
uh, that last anthology was uh, co-edited by our other translator, the only one who couldn't be here uh, in person today, uh, Eugene Astashevsky, but we will hear his pre-recorded uh, re recitation of, of poetry. So Eugene Astashevsky, I will still introduce him. He is a poet and translator. He also teaches humanities at uh, New York University. This uh, semester that happens in Shanghai, China, that's why he's now asleep and not with us. Uh, he's um, uh, the author of four poetry collections and the editor and main translator of several volumes of Russian avant-garde and contemporary poetry. Uh, he's recipient of several translation awards, such as the National Translation Award in 2014 for his translation of a volume by Alexander Vidyansky with Matvey Yankelevich. Um, and I'm getting close to the list, uh, to the end of the list. Uh, Andrew Reynolds, my colleague at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, professor of uh, Russian literature, the School of Russian Poetry, in particular Mandelstam and uh, Brodsky. Uh, and uh, occasionally, when opportunity presents itself, uh, he translates Russian prose and poetry into English. And finally, last but not least, as, as they say, uh, Maria Vasilieva is a poet and translator. Uh, she has published two books of poetry in Bulgarian. She translates from English to Bulgarian and uh, Bulgarian to English. Her published translations from Russian into English include Lenore Garalik's uh, work, uh, in Garalik's volume, Found Life, that she also co-edited. Uh, for this volume, she translated several, uh, not several, but seven essays by Maria Stepan. This is the end of my introductions, and I think we are ready to start the reading. Our plan for today is to have a period of reading, approximately 25 minutes, followed by a period of conversation, then another period of reading and another period of conversation, as was um, said in the beginning by Sarah. Uh, uh, please, um, uh, this is the request for the audience, uh, please uh, uh, consider asking questions uh, towards the end of the second period of reading. And with that, I would like to begin sharing uh, English text on the screen. Uh, and we will start with an epigraph, but wait a second before I share the text. So, an epigraph. Oh, Masha, you are muted. Yep. I just wanted to add a couple of words, uh, a sort of an epigraph to an epigraph, because I, I am unable to be listening to all of this without, uh, without uh, saying some words of gratitude to all of you uh, for, well, not only for this amazing moment when after all these months and years of joint effort, we are gathering uh, all together to tweet and talk and celebrate, but for the unbelievable amount of work and care and love and attention that uh, each one of you invested into this book project. I'm smitten, uh, smitten and honored and uh, very happy. Uh, that's it. And now, uh, I'll mute myself for a second. Uh, sorry, it, it, it is still cold uh, here um, uh, in the countryside, and we're having patches of snow, and uh, it is easy to catch cold. And that's what I've been doing the last couple of days. Uh, catching cold and never losing it. Okay, so an epigraph uh, that serves as an epigraph to the book of mine that was written in 2000 and 2001, uh, and uh, the Russian title is Tut Svet, Here World in the English translation, and in Russian it goes like this. Tibia, no golos muzy tesnay, 
ні в пору слуху без ушей, ні уху ростом в крок небесний, ні тілу, що уже, уже. Вот чорнозем не без жильца. Вот чорнозем, но где жилиться? А воздух вон тобой клубиться, тобой разглаживается. Узнай по крайней мере зрение, сшивающий переплет, скача качелями в сирене, в тут свет и тот. For you, but the voice of the street and muse isn't right for an ear without ears, nor for an ear the size of heaven's sphere, nor for a body that's not in use. So black earth must have a dweller. So here's black earth, but where's she who dwelt there? And there's the air, it swells as you, and you calm the air down too. Recognize, if nothing else, the sea in that is stitching together the book's cover, leaping in lilacs like a swing into your world and there. Thank you, Andrew. Just yes. a quick intervention before our last longer uh, poem, uh, which comes from a collection, Songs of the Northern Southerners, uh, that uh, ballads that are included in this collection often rely on semi-familiar plots of romantic horror ballads transposed to the geographical limbo of late 20th century Russia. Thank you. The Bride. May was incredibly heated, white heat, in every tree birds flitted and flirted. Maidens glanced askance as they darted, air blew bird cherry through the streets, it would have swept anyone right off their feet. So for the child that is born in May, though she hide behind a curtain of tulle, you and in will gnaw through, knock knock who's, greedily snatch up this toy and play, at rocking it over the abyss, so they say. That Marussia was barely in her teens, outsiders thought that she was a fool, in through one ear and out of the other, the cool Moscow River Wars wind had blown her brains, carried her common sense downstream. She didn't stroll down the avenue, out with friends she rarely sashayed, the small gift of young living critters, that whiteness and sweetness and scarlet hue, bowed her over and gave her the jitters. But it was water that made her sorely afraid. Even from a tap and a trickle so thin, or from a kettle, the merest wisp of steam, that's why even as a teeny young thing, the few words were exchanged, no evening was complete without her swoon. She'd often tip over as if wanting to sleep, would show white like a saucer's underside. So they'd bring revivifying water to help, and she'd bite her lips into a bee sting and sail off into an unearthly spring. She even took safety pins to school to keep herself from harm. Permanent scar marks on her hands and arms Boats or ponds would set off alarms, or even benches next to pools. And maidenly May was all wrapped up in a cosmic heat, miracle ranging, rising to her bare knees from her feet, just like tea freshly brewed in a cup. And all this led, quite naturally, to changes. For example, a groom announced his presence like a firework display over the park, in the hot heaven with a cherished present, different from all others one could mention, like heavenly fabric from those with earth's mark. And so here's the coupure and veil of the dress, meters of lace, wings of inspiring advice on all sides, bows, ribbons, the corsets tight press, and the cathedral veil flowing astride. She's been cleared for takeoff, we guess. And so to the wedding, honey mead from lips spills, the day set was strictly planned by the hour, a week to wait, straightening up the frills, trying footwear on for sighs and thrills, making sweet partings in the hair. But one old woman, her neighbor has noted, the bride's soul is ill at ease, heart in mouth and nowhere to put it, and she grows thin and wan and grieves and sits alone every eve. So this old dame gathered up her pluck, a fortifying spoonful of air in her chest no more, and snuck up to the nearest door, and eaves dropping almost sank to the floor. Ah, and oh, was all she heard time after time, as water rumbles all through the pipes, its angers truly bowed over the brim, water imp, water imp, water imp. Just my luck to take after him. And what on earth does he want with me, who announced himself like patrimony? On a dread day of my forgotten childhood, I locked myself away from him in a wardrobe, and to this day haven't set myself free. I should get married, be curled up like a vine, but my harsh master is spooking me in every cracked cup in the kitchen, 
quietly splashing, stay in line, glistening in ripples, vengeance is mine. How I'm scared of him, that old guy, whenever some running water is sprinkling or heaven's thunderstorm winking at the troubled green of my eye, that's him hinting, yes, all this is I. And so the neighbor turned silent heels, walked the whole corridor length, teeth, teeth a chatter, trying to escape this terrible natter with no one to advise or to heal in white robes behind an ambulance wheel. But no sooner had she resolved to bear witness and report this to the appropriate quarters than in her cat's dish the shallow water as if brought to the ball, smirked and taunted her with the words, mind your own fucking business. And so it all remained a mystery. A car rolled up, decked in bows and sprays, with a pink doll under bouquets, the doll that beautifies our special day. And looking like a divinity, down the stairs the bride descends, and running up the stairs the groom ascends, and held her up like a bouquet. And this car revved up and sped away, drove off and didn't return. The end. And fast withering, bow burnt by the sun, and whiter than brocade for the dead, speaking rarely and non hearsayly till a grave the neighbor, the neighbor merely sought out reports the mainstream papers would run. There was no consolation, none. Thank you very much, Andrew. We are making a chronological leap to the next collection that is uh, the title Physiology and Private History, published in 2005. And in this uh, collection, we see poems that constantly renegotiate the boundaries between public and private as poetic subjects, but also as historical subjects. Zachary. Hello, and just to warn you, there may be a cat interruption at some point during this. Um, the women's locker room at Planet Fitness. Nothing in common but warmth and fleece, lone same keys and nine orifices, filled with what? Moisture, pleasure, shit, covered by a mouth, closed by sleep. Baking up blood, tears, kids and wax, surrounding their essence or another's flesh. Of my own nine, I enter, sat to remove, I stood to be and head to the pool. Pink and yellow, big like babies, naked nude, towels to the neck, crossing the floor are flocks of girl trees, each to the shower, languidly leaning its trunk. Like types of wine and species of aves, they must be classe or curiosified. Here's collarbone plates, there sails of shoulder blades. We must catalog each foot arch height. Soon these ones won't be, soon they'll be replaced. Here will be wound in velvet, there the stage refaced. Visitors will stare amazed, not hiding tears, at the combos of bones, skin, and black braided hair. Some pretty boy on hand, or batty goodun, plays in the kitty garden, touching your plum, partaking of your pear, gathering in his mouth water. Then winter will come into it, bejeweled and cut up time, and the brother go unknown by the animal of mind. This pillar of water might turn to ice, reason to a poison, air to gas. Sweetie pies will march and stride in closed ranks through shops and shacks, and the door that led out to the swimming cube will open just a tad, like a, like a zipper on a boot, and we'll step out of slippers, nails, and crowns, from watches juxtaposed rags, our voices sounds, and into nostrils, ears, and mouths, like out a kettle spout, on mass they'll surge and spill souls who broke the lock. But like in forest school, the noisy surplus of creams, muscles, hair, armpits, and lips, self-tanner and shame, as vixens from their bores, look at our body's surface through the lenses of our pores. But like in cattle cars with cramped and vulgar mutter, squares of steam and lengthy howls roam wonder. Unbreachable, the sky becomes a brother, and someone sings in the shower room. In summer camps in, in July's blue shorts, first hanging back, then straightening spine and neck, my first eye, scowling like a bullet, makes its very first step. And furrowing the landscape like crushing paper in the hand, I look at it as almost with the sky, and will then lie down like ball lightning does in fields with a single revolution of the wheel. Thank you, Zachary. And before we read the next poem from uh, the same collection, 
I uh, would like to ask uh, Sasha Dugdale to read a fragment uh, from uh, Maria Stepanova's In Memory of Memory, which is a description of a photograph that is also um, uh, to which uh, the poem uh, Sarah on the barricades, on the barricades alludes. Uh, the poem is written probably in 2004. Uh, in memory of memory is written in 2017, but here uh, uh, the text that is written later uh, helps us illuminate a little bit uh, the context for the poem. Sasha. Thank you, Irina. A large copy, approximately 20 centimeters by 30 centimeters, of an old photograph. On the back, 1905, left to right, Ginsburg, Baranov, Galpa, Selvova. The original is in the Gorky Memorial Museum, number 11281, research associate, associate Gladinina, question mark, a round blue stamp above the number. It's winter and the snow under their feet is trampled. Dark shaggy fur coats and hats with a spotting of white. The usual smudging you get on an old photograph, the dots and lines that obscure the picture. Great-grandmother Sarah, first on the left, looks older than her 17 years. Her hat, the sort that's fastened with pins, has slipped to the back of her head. A strand of hair has escaped, and her round-cheeked face is red raw. You can see how cold she is. One of her hands is tucked into her coat's cuffs, another is balled into a fist. Her right eye, injured on the barricades, is covered with a black bandage like a pirate's patch. This was in Nizhny Novgorod. The barricades were built during the uprising that began on December the 12th, 1905, and was put down by artillery after three days of street fighting. In our family folklore, this photograph is actually called Babushka on the Barricades. Although, of course, you can't see the barricades, just a white brick wall and to the side a little fence engulfed by a pile of snow. When you look carefully, you can see how young they all are. The handsome young moustache in his grey fur cap and galpa with the prominent ears, whom I do not know, and her friend with the childish face and high cheekbones. Sixty years later, only the women have survived in the archival memory, Sarah Ginsburg and Sarah Sredlova, little Sarah, the sister of Yako Sredlov, sitting on the bench outside the home for old Bolsheviks, two grey-haired old ladies in thick coats, warming themselves in the winter sun pressing old-fashioned muffs to their stomachs. Thank you, Sasha. Now to Ainsley, I believe. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sarah on the Barricades. The year 1905. In the cradles sleep no more. Tiny hands unshod, open eyes, toothless mouths yawn wide. Packed in the train like Gledon in his barrel. Oh no, like sardines packed in a tin, rattling off to distant steps. Over them in Tambov and in Yesk, in the sackcloth of drapes gone feral, they sigh, the, those misty Jewish mamas, German, Russian, Polish, or, and the list of children's surnames, like a roster of those lost in war. Their future lady loves their girlies come spilling from grandfather's loins and peer into the eyes of needles that lead far into unknown wombs. The funny grove around the funny shame is curly as a picture frame. Above it twirl the scents of procreation, but no speaking of them. Then there are the mists of soup and toilet and headlines of today's financial news. First bell, a second class train, ink blot, and tear stain. I know it would be better not to know that these universal birthing pains, rhythmic as a cannonade, are the coming of a whole new strain, that into sleepless bassinets yawn these gaping hatches, that this demographic tide boils and bubbles with every type. Any old Martha from off the street boasts the same kind of folds, a map under every skirt, a yielding, nebulous, smooth landscape going under ice for years and years to come. A top should lie like tracing paper, the periodic layers of events, of spectacles and bloodlettings. A steamboat chugs across the heart from 1939. 
while in the throat a barricade in black and white, on which great grandma Sarah, her eye punched black last night, is tied round like a pirate's, and Sanka and Sarah Svrdlova are standing with the workers of the world. That's part two. Of all those lying in the earth, foreheads tossed back, keeping my speech in mind through the pine coffin, poured like dry grain into a tin can, playing in the city park, I choose one. In a white hat with girlfriend and friend on an alpine path where the centuries burning down like a wick, dwindling in the throng. On a summer day in the Luxembourg gardens where Mary Stewart is, where I too in a hundred years will stand and there's no cover in your tracks. On a winter night in Villefranche-sur-Mer, watching the lights go. In Petersburg, in prison, here, look. Sorting through the desk box in the Moscow apartment on Pakrovsky Boulevard, in the communal latrine, in the hospital ward, in a white coat, receiving patients. Now only in my crowded skull, with her daughter, her granddaughter, her great-granddaughter, me. This feminist firmament, its swallow, its storm cloud, the Noah of a female ark. And when she crowns that barricade, I will not bear her arms, her breasts, but neither will I cover her with a flag, for there is no such flag. And neither red nor blue and white is any good for things like this. Now from on high, the radio turns on liberty, barricade, democracy. And for them, Sarah Ginsburg's a demonstration, perhaps of the reasons for poetry. Though any old acacia growing wilds, both easier and better for things like this. But who can tell the difference anymore? And if you put our Sarah in a vase or drape the barricade with acacia, it's the same number of the estimated year we get when we go look up the solution. Thank you. And I must say that this is a translation by um, Ainsley and Emily Glazer, who will read uh, the next poem. Thank you. This too is a translation by both um, me and Ainsley Morse. The desire to be a rib, one. Me and myself, we're uneasy, like a lady with her pit bull. Here I, a many-headed storm, strike this little village. Here I'm some saber-toothed dino at a peaceful feast. Better grab me by the and shove me in this drawer, like into a chest of drawers, my chest, between this rib and that one, beyond borders of skin, flesh, bone, into this inviolable lifetime home. I relinquish my rights to one sleeve and the other. I relinquish my lefts to doubt, opinion, rage. I relinquish speech. I sever myself from shoulders, face, coat, and bra for the sake of this vocation, the ribs. I want to lie here in your midst like messy hens up in their nests, like flat herrings in their tins to hammer out your rib cages. I want to take part in the work of leukocytes or electrons, shock worker in the flesh works. I'll pack up all the sockets. Account for the state of the tissue, like Tanya from the textile plant, the whole of her dowry in two braids, dole out to you sateen and calico for covering over the empty, the endless hallways of our body, singing along with riddle songs popping open pores with flair, like that champagne bottle from before, like dark blood flowing toward the nape. Part two. Like back in wild childhood on not peeing yourself to concentrate on seeping shade-like under the skin layer, under the fatty membrane, under this nervy living scrap, under that bushel beyond the wet layers into filaments, stratified and hard, boring through a passage like some tick and gently lying down like something small. Thank you. We will make another leap to a collection that came out in 2010, The Little Boy, and uh, we will read two relatively short poems from uh, this uh, collection. 
And that will conclude our first part of reading. Uh, uh, Dmitry Manin. Sunday, burn like stars, elder trees, foam and fizz. By the railroad crossings, striped bars, a communal wall hovers. Past it are slabs like canvases dank in the dark and the moon cherry and tiny, tightly packed crosses, a darned sock or a cross stitch embroidery. Yellow dogs pass here at an easy trot and grandmas come to comb the sand. Giant women grind their temples into the rock, wailing and thrashing to no end. But these are times indistinguishable, like stumps, like my pair of knees. At the sun one stares, in the shade the other one slumps, both are dust and ashes. But these are nights when the nettle fox stands guard among the pickets here, and the gentle May enters his peaceful orchard, raining a tear. And between hen and hand, between day and night, there is inhumane, brightly burning, eternal quiet. Thank you very much, uh, Dmitry. And the very last uh, poem in this um, part of our reading will be read by Alexander Berliner. In every little park, in every little square, lovely people go about their lovely tasks. Girls stroll with strollers to give babies some air, buying little presents and Kaolin facial masks. Kaolin is only clay somewhere for your corpse to lay, mortal cells, your bread and doom, a collective cozy womb. By the pond with the laptops, the skypers are cutting a pretty figure. On the high Moscow rooftops, the snipers let their fingers dance on the trigger. The algurs of inauguration walkie talk their way to elation. On the streets, the city's protesters are brought down by their own posters. Wah, goo, shush, baby, please. Moscow's still there, no need to howl. Igor Sieraslavna is crying like an owl. I'll go get some cottage cheese. The selection of cheeses today is wide, as if the city had eaten its fill and died. Thank you, thank you to all of you who read uh, in this part. I will stop sharing my screen now you will be able to see all of you better again and i'll pass uh, the microphone <laughs> to kevin now. wow that was really wonderful um it's so wonderful to hear these to hear these translations and the voices of the translators um and it's wonderful of course also to have the poet here and be able to talk with her a bit um, and hear her voice as well um, I'm going to have some questions for the translators later on after the second section, but um, in this first section of discussion, uh, I'll start by noting that the reading today follows the structure of this volume. The chronology of your career, uh, Maria, um, and so it makes sense for us to take a break here that corresponds to our arrival in the volume and in your work at two essays uh, that were written at the end of the 2010s, um, around the time when your poetics experienced something of a shift. Um, this was also around the time when your public role was experiencing a shift as you assumed a more and more prominent position as a critic and editor. And it was around the time when Russian society shifted radically uh, when Vladimir Putin returned to the presidency in the face of intense oppositional protest. Uh, I'm not going to describe this shift in your poetics. Uh, I'd like to leave it to you to do that. Uh, but let me ask a question about that shift. Um, one could tell two stories about this moment in your career. 
Uh, one might propose that your poetics shifted as a result of your development as a poet towards new problems, uh, new challenges. Uh, or one might propose that your poetics shifted in reflection of the new and different stakes of writing in a changed Russian society. Uh, probably it's both of these things together. Um, how can you describe the shift in your writing and of your understanding of the role of poetry between the 2000s and the 2010s? What is the relationship between your changed approach to writing and the changed circumstances of writing in Russia? Um, thank you, thank you, Kevin. Uh, it is an extremely interesting question or questions. And uh, I'm not that sure I'll be able to give a full answer right now because it, it will take uh, it will take some some time and uh, and maybe drink to be <laughs> to, 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 to be able to have a, a decent conversation on all these topics and they are as you know they are quite painful for anyone not necessarily living on the post-Soviet territory, but also for those who are working with uh, Russian literature and uh, with Russian language. And uh, my answer to your first question is maybe, well, sure, you are right. And uh, well, I've been growing up and I still am and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I still feel as if I was just beginning uh, to do something serious. And uh, the state our countries right now, uh, it is, well, as serious as ever, and maybe even even more, because all the news we're getting throughout, throughout, throughout the last, well, you name it, the last months, the last years, the last decade, they are getting more and more grim. So we are getting used to, to the amount of bad news arriving. But I suppose that uh, the main thing that was leading me to be changing my, my poetic diction, so to speak, was the changes happening to the language itself. And uh, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't overestimate the value and the intensity, well, the, you know, the, this uh, love-hate relationship between a poet and uh, her language, uh, because I suppose that a couple of generations uh, ago, it was the most intense thing, but uh, I am treating the whole thing differently. But still, after a number of certain historical shifts, something happens with the language. And uh, it is not the things the language forces the a, a, a poet to address. It is happening inside the language. It is just suddenly starting to show off its uh, uh, militaristic side, so to speak. You are suddenly stumbling upon the remnants of uh, habits and mannerisms that are dating back to the 19 something, 18 something to the back, back to the 18th century, for instance, that are suddenly becoming too vivid. And uh, the language is starting to change. And uh, your vision of what it does is getting more and more distorted. It is getting so, so dispersed that you feel that you are unable to treat it now with the old measures, with the old means of, you know, traditional Russian uh, meter and rhyme uh, poetry system. So you have to change. And uh, it is hard to put your finger on what is the entity that is urging you to, to, to be changes, to be changing. Is it the language or history or, or uh, your own little, mm, ego that is trying to cope and trying to catch up with things changing. 
I don't really know, but I feel that the questions I've been answering uh, 15 years ago need uh, a different system nowadays. And so I'm trying to, uh, to invent it. So if I understand you correctly, I mean, it's, it's a response to the transformation in the, in the materials that you have to deal with, the basic linguistic materials um, shifting under your feet. Do you feel like as a poet, and you're a, an extraordinarily powerful poet within Russian letters right now, many people read your poetry. Do you feel like you can contribute to a transformation in language? Do you have a goal in your intervention in the poetic language or in Russian language more generally uh, in your interventions? Mm, I, I, I guess I wouldn't say it is my goal because uh, I, I think I have a, my attitude is slightly different. I think that uh, mm, poetry is not so much a temporal art, a temporal thing, uh, uh, than a spatial one. And uh, so writing poetry is creating places to be inhabited. And uh, the, the, that's what I'm, what I'm doing. I am trying to open a certain sequence of space for someone to inhabit. And uh, when I'm doing it, I'm not, uh, I'm not aiming to make some, well, you know, grand redesign of all the mechanics of Russian language or um, wording, whatever. But uh, I am trying to make my own language and uh, my own space, my own, well, tiny, uh, tiny uh, piece of uh, literary ground. I'm trying to make it as livable as possible. And uh, we are uh, living in the times when, uh, when ecology uh, is an important thing uh, in terms of poetry, as well as uh, in a number of other ones. We are to be able to create some, to make some shelters for people to stay there and then to be able to move further. And that's what I'm trying to do. That makes perfect sense. But it's also startling to hear uh, from a poet who I associate so heavily with the question of the operations on history uh, and on memory uh, that the, the orientation is geographic or territorial, um, opening up a space in a period when the, the borders are closing, where Russian language can actually occupy some different territory than the one which is, which is uh, walled off by a state. I wanted to yeah. turn with another question. I, no, go ahead and answer that if you want. I wanted no, to no, ask no, no, no. about the as well. Um, but is that okay? I wanted to turn to, to the translator of these two essays, uh, who's Sibyl and Forrester, um, and ask a little bit about their selection and translation. Um, the first of the two essays that we're talking about that come in the middle of this volume deals with the, the problem of the Russian poetry boom of the, uh, of the 2000s, uh, or perhaps we should say the commercialization and commodification of poetry in the 2000s. And the second of the two essays concerns the shift beyond lyric poetry. Um, as we know, um, Sibylin is both a translator of poetry, poetry and a poet. Um, I wanted to ask how you understand, Sibylin, the significance of these essays for the non-Russian reader. Besides offering a window uh, into Russian poetic life, it strikes me they, they speak to certain transformations in Anglophone poetics as well, or maybe in world poetics that were taking place at the same time. Um, with or without Putin, poetry in America has also been moving rapidly towards a new generation of political engagements, a new generation of deterritorializations of hierarchically controlled language. Um, we could think perhaps of the publication of Norsebe Phillips's Zong in 2013 uh, as a kind of climactic moment in similar kinds of transformations in, in Anglophone poetics. How, do, how does Stepanova's essays speak to Anglophone literary culture 
or maybe to world literary culture? I felt strongly that uh, the displaced person spoke most strongly to Russian political culture, po poetic culture rather, of that moment. And it spoke to me particularly about the emergence of discourse about poetry on social media. I felt that, um, you know, it's one thing to publish a review in an essay uh, in a in a journal, it's one thing to get up at a poetry reading and comment about somebody else's writing, and it's quite another just to blow something out on Facebook. So I read it very much as reflecting the emergence of another sphere that sometimes um, cut down in the responsibility that the person posting felt about what they were saying, and so um, obviously applicable to poetry in the United States and applicable to everything else. But um, one thing I've noticed about poetry in the United States recently is just a proliferation of different groups, different styles, different um, identity communities, let's say, which, which largely um, pull people together out of interest in topics and interest in background. So that I, I really feel one different thing about poetry in the United States today is that there's not a movement that you can point to. And of course, you can never point to a movement until afterwards and say this was the most important thing because maybe the most important thing was happening in Santa Fe or, or, or San Francisco or I don't even know Miami at the time and, and you just happened not to be there and missed it. So, so that, that essay to me was, I don't know, by the time I translated, I felt as if also possibly the moment had, had moved into the past. Mm -hmm. I wanna ask another question uh, here to both of the translators of the essays. Um, and I'll note that you know, in addition to Sibylin, we have Maria Vasilieva here. Uh, together, they translated a number of additional essays that constitute the final section of this book. Um, I should say and, we didn't translate them together, each of us. Right. Yes. This is the first time I've met Maria Vasilieva. They each translated several of the essays which make up the end cap of the book, as well as these two that are in the middle. Um, and the question I wanted to ask concerns the style of these essays. Um, it might seem that translating prose is an easier task than translating poetry. Um, you know, you're concerned with getting the sense right. Um, and the formal problems are less of an issue. But anyone who picks up this book will recognize uh, that Stepanova's is the prose of a poet, um, which always does something magical with language. I'm thinking about, you know, Boris Pasternak's prose, for instance, as I was reading these, these essays. Um, this is a kind of prose writing that creates special challenges, poetic challenges for the translator who's faced with uh, stylistic innovations that far exceed our usual expectations for prose. Tell us about the special stylistic challenges of translating Stepanova's prose uh, and how you met them. Um, I can try to answer that. Um, I remember it was very hard at first when I printed them out and I'd read them before just as a reader and I realized, okay, now I have to make them sound good in English and follow all the intricacies because so many of their arguments are kind of based on the logic of metaphor and like a very complex metaphor made up of various, various parts and half of them are very specific cultural references that would need a lot of elucidation and a footnote. Um, and you want to preserve that complexity, but you also just want to make them accessible enough to a reader who wants to read an essay, right? Not a poem where they have to spend time with each separate line. Um, and here, really the editing process with Irina is what got us to the final stage because we had to have the back and forth and like go over each thing. Um, and for me, I just, I don't know, I had a tone in mind for what I wanted them to sound mm -hmm. like and that's what I was working toward. And it sounds a bit like alchemy, it's hard to describe, but that was my process. Alchemy is a wonderful way to put it because it really is, um, you really, to translate Maria Stepanova, you have to be susceptible to inspiration because otherwise you're not gonna get anything like um, a representation of the way she writes. I want to underline how important the passionate intellectual and aesthetic attention of Irina Shevilyanko was in these translations. She felt through every single word the, the essay I found the most challenging was the one on um, about Marina Tsutaeva and, um, and Irina was particularly wonderful as an editor there because she knows Tsutaeva inside and out. But the fact that clearly 
Maria Stepanova was channeling Marina Tsvetaeva in this essay. Um, I know Tsvetaeva's prose very well, and I've read translations of Tsvetaeva's essays, and that helped a lot. But the idea that um, Maria really is able to bring in the, the essential qualities of whoever she's writing about, the essay on Zebald feels Zebaldian, the essay on Tsvetaeva, to me, I felt like I had to live up to both of these amazing women writers in translating. The essay to pour it is also quite beautiful in that way, the way that it dialogues with the, the original. Um, I actually want to interject here and say that uh, everyone who can read Russian, even if you can't read Russian, look up the Elisa Porat book uh, that the essay is about. You can find a PDF that you can scroll online and see the beautiful images, um, kind of as a side adventure to reading voiceover. I highly recommend it. This is the book. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And it's it really is a, a wonderful thing. It's reading this essay on it was just eye-opening. It's filled with these amazing illustrations. Um, I think we're probably out of time for this middle section of conversation, but we're going to come back for more conversation at the end. And also, I'll just remind the listeners, uh, stack up your questions for Maria Stepanova, because we'll have time also for direct, you know, channeling questions from the listeners to, um, to the poet and to the translators. So hold your questions and put them into the chat at the end, and we will pass them along. But I think it's time now to pass uh, the floor back to the translators and to Irina, uh, who will orchestrate that. Thank you so much, Kevin. And thank you, uh, Sibylan and Maria and, and Masha. Uh, and we'll definitely have more time for a uh, conversation at the end. Uh, let us move on to a collection uh, called uh, Kirievsky. And uh, I will uh, say a few words, a few more words than I usually say, because I think it's, it's, uh, it's important for those who will hear this poem for the first time. Uh, so uh, Stepanova took uh, for the title of this uh, uh, collection of poetry, uh, the last name of Pyotr Kirievsky, a 19th century collector of folk songs. And uh, he was an amateur collection, a collector by our uh, standards today. He relied on many submissions from his contemporaries, also amateurs, who would often edit and correct texts that they recorded, or even submit their own imitations of folklore alongside original folk songs, as Alexander Pushkin claimed to have done. Uh, Stepanova had this premise uh, in mind when calling her book Kirevsky. As an author, she writes her text over the tradition, infusing it with a strain of experimental poetry and thus ensuring its transition into a new age. Uh, we will hear in Eugene Ostashevsky's reading uh, the first uh, uh, two, two poems from the first uh, sequence in Kirievsky called Young Women Are Singing, which he translated, in fact, as Young Maids Sing. Uh, it consists of ballad-like songs predicated on the experience of trauma, wars, purges, and post-Soviet havoc. Uh, the main tension here is between familiar, trivial tunes and strikingly defamiliarized lyrics. Uh, the two poems uh, we will hear evoke specific sources as well. Uh, the medieval Vita of Alexis, the man of God, in the first poem, and the song Katusha, a love song, whose heroine's name then became a nickname for a Russian rocket launcher in the Second World War. And the tension between the female name and the rocket launch is important. And with that, I will wa want to ask Sarah to share Eugene's reading. Can everyone see the video okay? Yes. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi, uh, Masha, Ira. Um, I'm going to read two translations from Dievushki Payut from Young Maid Singh, but I want to start with reading um, the first one of them in the original, just so that everybody hears what it sounds like to me, the way that the form of it um, uh, has to do with the kind of singing poetry that that our generation grew up with, um, and that in in lots of ways, although it has authors, is modern folk literature. So so listen to it the way that it sounds. Um, 
Ах, мама, что у нас за дворник живет в подвальном этаже? Его рассыпчатое имя не вспоминается уже. Уже не часто он проклятый, выходит на горючий лед, железной шаркой от лопатой, метрою, метлою острою скребет. Когда я утром одеваюсь и на работу ухожу, или когда я раздеваюсь и в ящик туфли уложу, в утробе тесного подвала, при свете ночи или дня, он все лежит, как покрывало, и бездна смотрит на меня. Ах, дочка, мы с тобой не знали, что наш пропавший Алексей живет в нетопленном подвале, полузабытый от людей. И что сам, а что сама ты не узнала, что это твой жених и муж, так это жизнь большая зала, по ней гуляет много душ. И что желтея апельсина, его не русские черты, так это тоже объяснимо. И мы с тобой давно не те, мы устарели, как трамваи, мы дотянулись до седин, а он, как лампа восковая, в подвале светится один. Um, I apologize for my singing. Everything I do is off key, and I even translate off key. Um, I, I mean, I tried to do this in English, but I couldn't do it. The line just kept collapsing, so I, I wound up doing something something else. Um, Mama, what janitor lives in the basement can't recollect his scattering name. Now seldom that damned man comes out on burning ice, shuffles the iron spade, scrapes with a bright broom. When at dawn I get dressed, come out for work. When at dusk get undressed, stick pumps in the dresser. In that basement womb, daylight on nightlight, he lies around like a bedspread. The abyss sets its sights on me. Child, how could we know? Our lost Alexei lies in the basement with no heating, have forgotten by people, and that you didn't know him for your groom and husband. It's that life is a great hall where many souls take a stroll and that they're yellower than an orange, his non-Russian features. It's too, it too stands to reason. We too are not what we once were. We have grown old like tram cars. Ashen is your permanent, while he, like a lava lamp, glows alone in the basement. Anyway, you see how non-matching the translation is, um, and how different lines have different melodies in the way that you have in early Zabolotsky and Vidensky, where there's a collision of, of meters. Um, uh, kind of like flipping the radio dial and getting not one song, but but many different songs to different melodies. Okay, the melody to this one you all know. If you don't know, it's on YouTube. It's Katusha, the 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 war song. Ordnance was weeping in the open for the hero's open wound. There he lay, his breast thrown open halfway in anticipation of the end. Battle prattle rattled in the eardrums, tattled sent regrets for plodding hammers. Female installation, the Katyusha, fed with Kasha, the whole panorama. And while she was pounding close in targets as she polished off the river banks, for the one she was in love with, for the one she could not save, raining dust and down off his service coat, tensing infantile wings to fly. The air of the gray eagle of the steps kept watch over his parent from the sky. Because Russian melodies are so important here, metrics are so important here, it's weird. I mean, <laughs> translating it, they just keep entering the translation um, and you can't push him out. So it, in a way it becomes ruslish 
and it becomes like uh, that line of Ovid in Tristia where he talks about writing uh, poems in Getic, but using the Roman system, which is actually the Greek system. Thank you, Genia. I hope he hears us uh, in his sleep. And um, we will continue with uh, Kirievsky, and I will start sharing uh, my screen again with a few more uh, poems from that uh, collection. Let me scroll down, skipping the parts that Genia already read. So we'll hear two more poems from uh, another sequence in Kirievsky called Underground Pathophon, which we hear, as we understand from the title of this uh, sequence, Voices from Under the Ground. So uh, it's interesting uh, that I have a couple of words to say about the rhythm, the meter of this poem as well. Um, it's English ballad meter uh, that was introduced into Russian poetry by Zhukovsky in the 19th century with his translations of English and German ballads. And he's lived in the Russian poetry uh, ever since and kept its distinctive flavor and I always enjoy a lot uh, bringing back into English. So, my dear, my little liberty, I wanted you, but why? A tiny boat runs on the sea, alone in it, I lie. A teaspoon sits beside a plate, but nothing's left to stir. I've done some being around the place, I will not anymore. My soul, Unmarred, unmarried, you are all mist and dew, homely and unhurried, beautiless and subdued, where the azure used to sparkle in vermilionish banks, there muscular and masculine clouds close their solid ranks. Thank you very much, Dmitri. And another one, Alexandra. There he lies in his new bed, a bent of paper round his head. Such a mustached gentle yum, now in the coffin, all alone. So here he lies, all numb and quiet, and the color of his face is growing yellow from inside. But you would best avert your gaze, for deep within, just like a clock, that's scratching its tick-tock, tick-tock. He still produces, dull and low. He's never ceased, I love you so. But all the people at his side, they wouldn't hear him if they tried. Just us, we watch from the plafond, invisible, but not for long. Each one of us, so well we know, I too had squadrons to command. War in my mouth, I love you so. War around my head, a paper band. Thank you very much, uh, Alia. And we are moving to a section uh, that was is an addendum to Kirevsky, a cycle, a sequence called Four Operas, uh, no longer dealing with uh, Russian folk sources, but rather with uh, world famous operas. But as you will see, the distance between the opera you're familiar with and uh, uh, Stepanova's poem is probably as big as the distance between folk sources in Kirevsky and the poems that uh, Stefan wrote. Uh, Sibylan will read those. Thank you, Irina. That was just what I was going to say about these <laughs> poems. Carmen, they still allow us to smoke in the office. They get it. This kind of work you have to smoke. They run after one as he's walking. Hey, commander. The second from the table raises his eyes to the door. The second one from the trial raises his eyes to a hook. There the lamps swaying back and forth. Svetlana 
what'll I say when the earth quakes and the ground opens its mouth and the arrested earn their execution? The third one stands up, decorated, and he has everything. But they've called him and he goes, look for me at dawn, he says to his comrades, as if he and they are he and someone else who's alone like Job and waits for him like for a storm. What's that blue sign on his arm, sister? That's a powerful sign on his arm, girlfriend. There it sort of says, beloved, my darling, take care of yourself. Don't lie on the take, sorry, don't be on the take in front of everyone. Give your parents a call, take time off on Wednesday. If you don't take it, try to behave yourself. And if there's anything, call. If there's anything, call for me. and Iphigenia in Aulis. The action continues by the water. A fatal war, trenches, swords, cuirasses. The yids occupy the war's left bank. The faggots stand in formation on the right. This battle takes place on foot. It will never end. We'll grind through and chew up 500 generations. We'll have its way like a nuclear winter because cavalry attacks them from the heavens while darkness comes on from under the ground, piercing the heel and poking the knees apart. Each one of us stands on that bank or this. Each one of us didn't lay down arms at once. Each one of us, long as we're still alive, looks toward where the flag bearers are consulting. The riders whistle and shout back and forth where willy nilly you turn into a poet. Let me join the yids or the faggots. I've been dreaming of this since third grade, to become a stag or a ram for you, a fatted heifer or a pudgy ant, a maiden revealed in the bushes. With a sword in my chest, I sing and do not die in the war waged on the foothills of paradise. Thank you very much, Sibylon. And uh, that poem was written in 2010 when there was no war on the horizon, or so we thought. Uh, and uh, our last um, uh, piece of, um, uh, uh, of poetry that will be read uh, at this reading uh, is an excerpt from a poem, A War of the Beasts and Animals, uh, written in 2005 uh, during the active phase of a Russian intervention in Eastern Ukraine. And uh, the title of this uh, poem uh, at once embodies hate speech and deconstructs it. It is a poem about mutual dehumanization whose uh, privileged medium is language. And Sasha Dagdale can kindly greet to read a middle part of mid uh, from her translation of this poem. Thank you, that's a beautiful introduction. That night, over the field of battle, the Nachtigall tells the Nachtigall, night in gasps, in disbelief, and in neighboring places, bird tells bird passing from beak to beak, like a dead frog, the exact science. Earth's caesura, between the stains of the sighted between one mottled zone of streetlights warmed by proximate life and its answering beam. The sightlessness of moss on boughs, anxious flight, armored vehicles, lenses aimed at movement. No difference between first and second, patriotic or patriotic, great or Pacific, Atlantic, world, all the same they fall to the only, the civil, where sunrise quivers in the cinders, draws out the spear tips. Mate, hey, mate, gives a light, says the dead to the dead, says the killed to the killer. The flower dies under a skin of grass, mouth blackens, stumps, trickily crust. Earth takes the dead, she keeps them, and brings them up when she must. The sensible animals hold court. The witness box is a transparent lung, 
dark and trickled, the way is damp. The bitch suckles her young. The judge lifts its eyes from the bench to daylight's low hung bulb, holds up wanted posters and asks the jury if I am absolved. Barely pausing their talk, yesterday's brothers emerge from the cops in charred pelts, mud crusted, get up on the court, whip on the cart, whip on the horse, to where the meadow holds an awning, pins a path of stinging plants and thorns. The way back is belted down. Even hope is stillborn. How to justify this on the greedy tongue milk writes in curds and paper is marked by tree rings. Traces of acts, a fool's words, magna imago. The acacia has long blossomed. The army is long gone. Mellow declamation has spread it, its wings and flown. Ride a cock horse to wherever the cross and rip out the stuffing and give it a toss and freedom needs stripping. Stay standing lads as long as you can, bust the joint, smash the game. One of our gang will crouch in a hole wherever we are and swig champagne. Gypsies dead, hussars defunct. Dusk now falls, colour shrunk. Pitter patter across the heart, sputter spatter on the tablecloth. Voices raised in lament, which once were full of joy. Who is that riding onto Red Square towards St Basil's Cathedral? Countries rejoice, cities jubilant. Across my territory begins two minutes history. Vixens bark at the crimson shields. Mosquitoes drone drowns out the pealing of bells. Russian hares in all the polling stations. The country has spoken. And then the midges, tearing themselves from flesh, rotate tactically overhead. Who wouldn't want to be drinking the quiet dawn from grandfather's wooden cup going back in time? Rub your eyes, put kebabs on the fire, reclaim those words, sprinkle them on soup. Sprinkle earth. Blast the volunteer, a fortnight dead, forgot the ruble rate and what the sparrow said and where he was from. A current of explosive air held his bones in embrace. As he flew, the years passed from him, chubby-cheeked, babbling. Ruski or Ukrainian, oh you, whoever you are, in this neglected crossing place. Consider Vlas. Vlas was nicer than you. So would you want to continue to comment at all, uh, Sasha, on, on this last uh, segment? Yeah, show, yes, yes. You, well, uh, Irina, why I don't show, you say? Because um, it, it's interesting. Quite a lot of people have asked me in other readings of the of the poem whether um, I um, made up that bit um, at the the proximity to the T. S. Eliot, and I absolutely didn't, of course. But um, it's quite funny that people people have thought that. Would you like me to read the wastelands? Um, section just so you can hear the sure absolutely what what what, what uh, Maria has done with it in English. Russian you mean ah in, in English but oh, no well, yeah sorry yeah yeah go ahead Libus the Phoenician a fortnight dead forgot the cry of gulls and the deep sea swell and the prophet and the loss a current under sea picked his bones in whispers as he rose and fell he passed the stages of his age and youth entering the whirlpool. Gentile or Jew, oh you who turn the wheel and look to windward, consider Phlebas, who was once handsome and tall as you. Yeah, 
Uh, thank you, Sasha. And uh, this is not the only place in uh, War of the Beasts and the Animals uh, where uh, the wasteland uh, the wasteland appears. It actually begins uh, also with a very very clear uh, allusion uh, citation uh, quotation from uh, from the poem. So to conclude our reading today, um, I would like to um, uh, have Maria Vasilieva read an excerpt from an essay. Uh, that uh, Maria Stepanova wrote um, around the same time, just slightly before the War, uh, war of the Beasts and Animals, uh, that uh, deals with the situation uh, in Russia uh, and um, uh, in, in the minds uh, of, of Russians who were watching in uh, with uh, dismay and in disbelief uh, and what was going on. Uh, at that uh, time in Russian politics. So this is a concluding excerpt from an essay called After the Dead Water. After the Dead Water. They say that if you file down the very tip of a crow's bill, the bird will start crashing into things. The fine-tuned sense of direction, the organ of long-range connection to the future will cease to work. All distances will collapse into one. All sense of proportion will be lost. There will be no exit. I believe that this is how we orient ourselves in time. If we file down our sense of tomorrow, we will always crash into the corners and cornices of the past, which is all there is to it anyway. It's interesting to think about the distortions that happen in a mind that makes no provisions for the future, which has been disinfected, anesthetized, carefully masked under the guise of the present or excluded and ignored like a faux pas. In a world that contains just the present and past, any personal choice loses its substance. Events happen as though of their own accord, following the will of things without any desire on the part of participants who are barely even participating, just using the circumstances that befell them. Everything that happens has a whole nomenclature of prototypes, which makes it easy to relieve oneself of a responsibility to spread it across a dozen convenient generalizations. Some of them you hear very often. We have to compromise in difficult times. Artists have always collaborated with those in power. There's always been censorship. Always is a key word here. It allows us to not be the exception. The future as a paradigm shift an opportunity to act not as always evokes great distress. But there's no place to hide anymore. History has caught up with us and it won't be easy to work ourselves free from it. We could of course wind back what can be rewound, erase accidental features, the, the feverish fluorescence of movies and books, exhibitions and shows, falafel and meatball shacks and prepare for a long siege. This is already happening a little bit. State television is mimicking the Soviet 70s and 80s. The press is eager to catch up with it. Things that until recently seemed like a collection of artifacts, souvenirs of lost time, have suddenly acquired an unexpected terrifying cohesion. As if everything that spent decades locked up in attics, crypts, and other far corners of the mind has suddenly joined a parade of dead things. It's like the old fairy tale. They put together the rotting pieces of the dead man splashed some black water on him and he shuddered and now his unseeing eyes are about to open. But this very water is unalive. It pulls together the mishmash of the late Putin years into a kind of system. It holds together layers, layers of language that have burned down to ashes, lets them rise to the surface once more. Before it disappears, the dead should become solid, whole and visible, and one can't turn away from it or hide from it. Vladimir Propp writes about this. The hero is first splashed with dead water and then with living water. The dead water finishes him off, turns him into someone definitively dead. It is a kind of funeral rite, corresponding to the covering with earth. Only now is he an actual dead person and not a creature caught between the two worlds which can come back as a vampire. Only now, after the sprinkling with dead water, can the living water act. The dead water has been poured. Now we live to see the water of life. Thank you very much, Maria. And we will end the reading part with this. And I will pass the microphone back to Kevin. Wow, that was so amazing. Um, 
And once again, I just want to say uh, thank you to all the translators and to Maria for these incredible poems um, and essays. Um, I want to talk with um, Maria a little bit more about the poetry at this point. Um, and then we'll have some questions for the translators and then also um, turn back to the audience. And I'm certain the audience will be generating some questions for the Q&A as well. Um, but I'll start with saying, um, you know, the audience has noticed, um, of course, that Maria's poetics, her poetry, uh, especially later in her career, become more and more um, symphonic in terms of the, the multiplicity of voices that she animates, the multiplicity of forms that she um, manipulates and brings into play, the multiplicity of, of preceding texts of various different levels um, in the, uh, the cultural canon, um, both from the past and from the present. Um, Maria, your poetry collection of 2017 uh, was titled uh, Against Lyric, which is also the title of one of the essays uh, or, uh, that we're discussing uh, before. Against Lyric could be taken in the United States as a more or less recognizable slogan um, of conceptualist or postmodern poetics uh, signaling a step away uh, from identification of poetry with a coherent lyric subject towards discourse poetry, perhaps, that critiques ideological language, socially constructed subject positions, literary and other conventions from a position of ironic distance. Um, but I think it would be a, mis a misunderstanding, actually, to identify your poetics and your work with that position in any straightforward way um, it seems to me that your work around the lyric I um, and around lyricism speaks precisely to the exhaustion of a poetics of ironic distance. Um, I want to quote from a place in Spoila, uh, in Sasha Dugdale's translation here. Spoila was a, a work that we didn't hear from today. Uh, you write, I teach straying from I, yet who can stray from me? This eye follows you from here till the hour of death, throbs in your ears till you say, here I stands. I do not say these things for a ruble or to fill up the time while I wait for a boat. It's you talking, not I. I is your native tongue tied in your mouth. In mine, it began to wag. While we sleep, I thinks about you. Um, your work, I think, combines a striving towards distance from the lyric um, and from the subjective positions of many others, past and present, fictional figures, poetic predecessors, ancestors, but also this sense of the inevitability or the weight uh, and necessity of those biographies, of voices, of positions in time and place. Can you speak a little bit to your unique, your combination of critical distance from the voice, um, from your own voice and from others, but also this deep identification with the voice or sense of the necessity of voices. Thank you so much, Kate. And I'll try to, well, to elaborate a little bit. Uh, uh, even it, uh, mm, it would be hard to me to, 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 to define uh, the, 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 the exact point I am to start from because it is such a multi-layered thing for me and uh, in a way uh, that is a, that is the question or, uh, or, or a problem I've been struggling uh, for years and years and I still keep on trying to, to, to do something with it. I had always, always find, uh, found uh, problematic uh, the straightforward uh, confessional mood of the lyric I, that is, uh, I suppose, well, in, in, in different ways, in different cultural and political circumstances. But it is still the mood that is highly popular, uh, both in, uh, in the Russian poetry and uh, in the English speaking world, I suppose. Uh, a poem uh, is, uh, well, used or treated 
as uh, SMS, as a message, while it should be uh, happening. You remember that uh, line of Daniel Harms uh, about a poem that should be thrown into the window, breaking the window. So it should have this solid quality and ability to change things. And yes, of course, we know that poetry makes nothing happen, uh, etc. But uh, is it really so? Uh, I suppose that uh, poetry is the thing that that actually enhances things happening. And uh, I've noticed once, um, well, I don't remember is if, if this essay is present in the book, maybe Ira remembers. Uh, there, is, um, there is this place in uh, uh, um, this line of Mundelstam uh, talking to Sergei Rodakov, uh, where he is uh, uh, calling Ahmatova a seagull, uh, the one that is constantly present at the scene of some historic tragedy at the battlefield. Uh, uh, actually, it is, well, it sounds a bit insulting because what, what, what he's actually saying is uh, wherever bloodshed happens, uh, Ahmata was always becoming really visible, but really loudly, really present. But I suppose that that's not as much about Ahmatova than uh, uh, about poetry itself. Something happens with it or because of it in the times of significant historical shifts, when the, uh, when the uh, uh, ordinary progress of history is somehow going broken, poetry becomes as loud as possible and uh, its audience is getting wider, uh, which supposedly means that somehow, I don't know how, but it does something. Maybe it moistures the wheels of the child. Maybe it somehow stops them from turning to, 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 to actually, I don't really know. But uh, you feel the necessity of poetry, the urgency of poetry, uh, when everything else seems to stop working. And uh, I suppose that uh, we're having good times for poetry in Russia nowadays. And uh, it doesn't uh, say as, well, lots of good about our uh, possible prospects. Uh, but still the poetry is, is stunning. So coming back to the lyric I, I don't opt for the hierarchic thing that uh, makes you, that somehow makes you feel that your own story, your own voice, your wonderful, uh, beautiful, uh, God knows what, diction is uh, somehow more interesting or more insistent than any other tone of voice, any other mode of speaking. I would uh, prefer to to use all the quotations I am able to lay my hands upon, all the to include all the possible voice, not to stay there all alone, thinking too much of, an, of my own diction. Uh, Grigory Dashevsky, the late poet, is writing somewhere about the lyrical eye as an idol of sorts, the one who is, well, the, the god of futile prayers and, uh, well, uh, lofty generalizations. I am trying to, well, maybe not always successfully enough, but to get rid of the idol and uh, to give voice uh, to the others, not to one other person, but to a number, to transcend from a, from a solid into a choir. But transcendence is in some sense I think uh, it's an apt description of what you do. There's also a, an embodiment which takes place, um, which speaks back to this question of the absence of irony. These are all voices which enter into your 
work. And if there's irony, it's an irony of their inability to themselves mesh together in a way which achieves a certain kind of a crystallization of sense. I, I see your play with history. And I love the way that you brought up history here too. Maybe there's a way of rephrasing the question just in relation to history um, and returning to something we said a little bit earlier. I, I really associate with much of your work with a, a work on cultural history, on your family history. Um, in, the, in the 1990s, it seemed like history was over um, to use a, a banal truism of the 90s, especially in the Soviet lands, which made it possible to play with it, um, to play with history, past forms, voices, poetic traditions, seemingly without incurring any costs. There was a kind of a free-for-all. Now it seems like the past has returned. Uh, as we just heard, you know, the living waters and the dead waters have, have brought it back with ambivalent results. That question of work on the past is central in your poetics. How has it changed since you began writing? You began with the, with the 1990s, with this moment of freedom with regard to the past. And now there's this sense of constraint. How has that shifted for you under your feet? Uh, when I was just starting uh, in, the, in the very beginning of 1990s, uh, I remember well enough and uh, it was a beautiful feeling. Uh, everything was so close to my own hands and to each one of, uh, of uh, the youngsters I, uh, I, uh, I was acquainted with. Everything was happening simultaneously. You remember the, this line from Gogol uh, that was uh, remembered once more in 1917. Uh, you are suddenly begin you are suddenly able to see everything in every spot of the world, like the Aleph of Borges, uh, that uh, allows you to see all the things possible simultaneously. And uh, that's what was happening with uh, more than a century of world literature and all the uh, yet unknown literature of the Russian underground that was uh, yet suppressed. And uh, so everything, we were having this, mm, this, uh, and I, I really think that, that that was a privilege. We were having this prolonged time of modernism. All the outer world was postmodernist to the core, but we were really able, naively maybe, but quitting uh, Nabokov or Pynchon or uh, you name them, J.S. Eliot, as our contemporaries of sorts, because they were published together with, uh, with, 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 with the Brodsky or Transtremor. It was all happening simultaneously. History stopped working as a, as this uh, ever turning wheel. You were able to put everything onto the same plate. Uh, and uh, it was amazing. And uh, as uh, all the amazing things, it didn't last long. Uh, and it has a number of uh, horrifying, well, personal, political, uh, societal consequences that it will take too long to, to talk about. Uh, but that feeling of, of uh, belonging to another historical time that is much more, much more kind towards the ones who are writing. Uh, it was a significant thing. And uh, since the beginning of, uh, of the new century, I suppose, and uh, that's not a Russian thing, uh, it is quite global. We are getting more and more mm, obsessed in, uh, with history, immersed in history. Uh, a long going story with the past is, uh, it is, it looms so large that we are unable to see anything else. And uh, for me, maybe it has changed during the last year, 
strange as it sounds, but still, because um, maybe that's the one uh, and only good consequence of the pandemic that I am able to feel. Uh, I feel as if the 20th century suddenly ended. And with that, maybe this obsession with the past, I felt so, so vividly uh, for years and decades. Uh, as if some final dot was put on the page. And now, of course, we are able to know the past, to love it, to be longing for it. But still, we are slowly and willingly, unwillingly entering the realm of the future. And uh, no one wants to get too close to the future. It is not a welcome prospect. But still, uh, we are almost there. And uh, I think that's good news uh, after all. Let's hope it's good news. But I'm, I agree, when people, when future historians write the history of the long 20th century, the long 20th century will end in 2019, 2020 um, with COVID. Um, I think we're, we're getting towards the end of our time. And I did wanna actually turn to the translators for a couple of moments, um, because I know that uh, audiences of translation often want to hear the answer to the question of what was hard here and what was impossible to translate here. Um, so I wanted to turn to, to all of the translators with that question to muse a little bit. And I also want to encourage people to buy this book because it's actually, it's a wonderful book in so many different ways. And one of the ways that it's wonderful is that it leaves a lot of space for the translators to actually talk about their process. Um, so if you are interested in that question as a member of the audience, you'll find many different answers um, from the variety of different approaches that were taken to translating this poetry and these essays in the book. But I wanted to give the chance to, translators a chance to speak to that question here. I'm not sure how to go about um, ordering them, but uh, maybe we could just allow someone to jump in. Who'd like to answer that question? Or Ira, do you want to do you want to pose that to someone? Uh, no. <laughs> I could I pose it to know. some individual. I think I want to, maybe we could yes. ask um, Sasha to speak to that question because she had some of the hardest work for a translator in this in this volume. Although all of it was challenging, I have to say. But Sasha, could you speak a little bit about your process um, in? translating, but also in some sense, adapting or triangulating these poems into a different language and cultural milieu. Uh, thank you. I, well, I think I spoke um, a little bit to this in a, an essay I wrote about translating War of the Beasts and the Animals. Um, and to, and I, I've, said, I say, I've said a few times, um, but I will say again that, that, that I wasn't really able to tackle um, the war of beasts and the animals um, until the political situation in Britain shifted, or at least my understanding of it shifted, because um, the poem requires quite a deep engagement, um, not just uh, a sort of um, intellectual engagement, I think it requires quite a lot of emotional engagement and also an awareness um, of the fragmentation of language in um, in Anglophone countries, and in my case, in Britain. So um, for a long time, I prevaricated and um, really suggested I translated the long poems, and I I I I basically made up excuse after excuse and job after job, and um, you know the hoovering, unloading the dishwasher, etc. And then finally, in 2016, um, we had Brexit and. Um, things changed very much here. The atmosphere changed a great deal. And there was a, an enormous rise in um, what Maria has already described, um, a sort of nostalgia for a past which was imperial and which was militaristic and which was full of, um, of Britain's rather pomp filled imperial past. And it became suddenly possible to translate the poem. It became po possible to speak in a language that 
that, that um, in which the poem could be written in English. And so um, my, I suppose that's how I see the difficulties. It was finding myself in a place where I could answer back fully because I do think of translation as a sort of dialogue. And so being able to answer and take part in that dialogue was what enabled me to translate. I think that's another way, and it, it points to another way that this book, but also um, Stepanova's work signals, um, you know, not just the long 20th century coming to a close perhaps, but also the, the way that certain of the divides that structure the 20th century are flattening out. Um, you know, this is a book which seems very Russian at the very beginning of it. And by the end of it, we get essays on Susan Sontag and Sebald, um, as well as on Porit and Svetayeva. And there's a sense in which those divides, those historical divides start to weave together in this book and in your translation as well. Um, maybe we could have one or two others speak to this question uh, before we have to end. You know, there are a couple of translators here who have uh, not had a chance to talk about their translation process. Um, and we haven't heard from them except their reading of their beautiful translations like Andrew um, Reynolds maybe could speak to this question as well of the challenges and uh, possibilities and losses of translation here. Okay, yes, thanks. So obviously many challenges, I think, um, trying to um, re-encode intertextual references, for example. So if there's a reference to Mandelstam in, in The Bride, uh, if I put that into English, no one will recognize it. So instead I have a reference to Auden, for example. Uh, if the ballad forms there are close to Zhukovsky or or if it's, if, if, if it's, you know, Tatiana's of Dream in Onegin, then I have to try and find something from, from Keats or elsewhere. So I think it was trying to find the, um, both you know, some of the metrical, but also literary elusive equivalents, which might at least you know, spark off that you know, memory in an English language reader to some of these places. So, so it's a search for those, um, you know, um, an analogs rather than, you know, sort of doing the exact translation of, of those particular details, I think. But uh, um, and then other voices, I'm you know I see the play with different linguistic registers and idioms. So I have to try and find something sort of similar with my puns or, or whatever wordplay or phonetic uh, connections. But obviously, the texture is not as rich as the original. But I have to sort of try and get something something close to that in in the translation, particularly of of, of the bride. I would I would say. Wonderful, um, Amelia, Zachary. Uh, I think you haven't had a chance to speak to this question in our presentation today. Do you want to make any comments? We did hear some wonderful comments um, uh, by Dimitri earlier on the ballad form. Um, but anyone have some last comments in this in this discussion of the the challenges of translating Stepanova here? No, that's okay. I think. Go ahead. I mean, I'll just. Oh. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, Ainsley and I translated this together and it was, first of all, just a, a um, glorious experience to, um, to work through these poems with someone else. Neither of us are native speakers of Russian. Um, so we each, what we did is we each translated the poem literally. We did it on a spreadsheet where we sort of um, each would then put our translation into a spreadsheet and we kept talking about it until our, our um, columns matched. And um, and uh, and so the pro the process of particularly the process of translating Maria's work um, was really fruitful this way because our occasional misunderstandings we would then contact Masha and we would you know then go back to the drawing boards and we would you know before Zoom was a thing we were doing a lot of Zoom and Skype meetings to go through this and um, uh, get to a point where our interpretation both on the literal level and on a sort of more philosophical level. Uh, felt like they were similar enough <laughs> that it could work. And that was, I, I think with your poetry in particular, Masha, I think that was a method that worked well. Um, with other poets, it may not have been necessary. Um, and I'll try to say something uh, half articulate uh, very quickly. Um, besides um, echoing what everyone else has said about the difficulty of trying to find some sort of echoes of the poetic references um, to Russian literature or even to, you know, often to, uh, to English literature. Um, I would say that for me, uh, especially in translating the women's locker room at Planet Fitness, um, which um, 
it was actually one of the first poems that I read of Masha's and I was trying to find something that I could submit for a, a contest that Dimitri and I uh, participated in. And um, for me, it was also, besides all of those challenges, it was also uh, a great joy to just, um, to try to find some sort of English idiom for uh, this, um, you know, even with the, the difficult themes that are in that poem, uh, there are some references to, uh, you know, uh, both besides just being in a locker room, there are also some references to the Holocaust. Um, but the, the use of language is um, so, so creative that you, you, um, you kind of lose, I, I, I felt myself just getting a chance to lose myself in, in that play with language. Um, and I, um, that is one of the qualities that I really appreciate in, in Masha's poetry that I hope to try and emulate. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I think we actually have to end at this point, um, but I wanted to like give a last chance to um, Irina to close things out since this is her event and her wonderful book and to uh, Maria, if she has final things to say to her audience and also to thank all of you for inviting me to, to talk with you about this amazing book and to spend so much time reading it this week and in the coming weeks. It's a wonderful achievement. Um, thank you very much, Kevin. And I don't think I have uh, much to add. I uh, really appreciate that our audience, like it's, uh, it begins to disappear, but still uh, uh, is patient with us going over time uh, today. And I would like to thank you, the audience, of course, thank you. Uh, all the participants, uh, and I hope some, at least some of you who are in America will still have a wonderful good part of May 1st uh, um, uh, after this reading. Thank you everyone. And thank you for all your work on, uh, on translations. That was uh, absolutely, um, uh, it was very, very courageous um, undertaking on the part of uh, all, the, all of those who participated. So I think that we're at the end. I think so. Thank you, and Masha. Then let's have some virtual applause. Hey, we can turn on the microphone. Mm. <laughs> okay, thank you I just wanted to say again, thank you, and thank you for, for, for everything, for, for this evening, for the mesmerizing translations, for, for the reading. And uh, well, now I am, grateful even to the pandemic for bringing us all together because it would sure be impossible without uh, without all the zooms and uh, and and stuff so yeah thank you it was an extraordinary evening thank you so much thank, thank you everyone thank you. thank you and thank you sarah for helping us hold this event and we can now end and the, the recording thank you